I'm Quello Inc. History, and today we're going to talk about the life of the philosopher Hypatia of Alexandria. If you wonder what sources I'm using, the scholarly literature I'll be referring to can be found in the description below. This video will cover the life, philosophy and death of Hypatia, as well as exposing the way she has been misused throughout history for ideological purposes. Hypatia was born in the middle of the 4th century, and she was the daughter of the Alexandrian philosopher and mathematician Theon. Being the daughter of a highly regarded upper class philosopher, she received the same education as boys in her social class. Exactly what this education might have been we don't know, but it likely would have included philosophy, astronomy, rhetorics and mathematics. As she became adolescent, Hypatia quickly proved herself to be more capable in mathematics than her father, and at some point she moved from being her father's student to being his colleague. Already by the age of 13, she had established herself as a formidable intellectual force in Alexandria, and sometimes in the 380s she took over her father's role as a teacher and instructor. Many people were impressed by her intelligence and a considerable amount of young people, who were impressed by her spiritual and intellectual gifts, accepted her as their master. By the early 390s, a circle of students had gathered around her, and while we don't know the names of all of her students, we can safely say that many of them were Christians, and that many of them came to occupy high places in the Roman Empire, like becoming dignitaries and bishops. One example of this can be seen in Hypatia's most well-known student, Synesis of Cyrene, who would later come to be elected as Bishop of Ptolemais after having finished his studies in Alexandria. Having friends in high places made Hypatia a powerful individual in the late 4th century AD, and the available primary sources also tells us that she had a voice in politics, with the city's ruler looking to her for advice on political and social policy. To quote a contemporary church historian Socrates Scholasticus, on account of the majestic outspokenness at her command, as the result of her education, she maintained a dignified intercourse with the chief people of the city, for all esteemed her highly, and admired her for her suffragine. Now Hypatia did not have any share in philosophy, but she did have lectures with her circle of students, and she also had public lectures for anyone in the city to come and listen. These lectures took place either in her house or in one of Alexandria's lecture halls, and it would most likely have centered around philosophy and mathematics, since these were the subjects that she was most prominent in. It would also likely have included a bit of astronomy, which we will soon see was together with mathematics closely tied to Hypatia's worldview. To fully understand Hypatia's philosophical views, we must first look at where she fits in the history of late antique philosophy. Hypatia belonged to the Neoplatonic philosophical tradition, which was founded by the philosopher Plotinus during the 3rd century AD. It developed from earlier Platonic philosophy, and placed its main focus on its religious and metaphysical aspects. The philosophy centers around the concept of the One, which according to Plotinus is the highest divine transcendent principle, and from which the rest of reality emanates. From the One derives the intellect, which is the highest order of reality that the human mind can access, and it bears responsibility for the organization of the material world. Beneath the intellect is the soul, which is the perfect image of the intellect. The soul is responsible for the generation of the material world, and unlike the intellect and the one, the soul is able to interact with the material world, and therefore serve as the mediator between the corporal world and the intellect. Human souls, according to Plotinus, are fragments of the greater soul that has forgotten its origins and dwell in material bodies. A process of developing higher level virtues that permits the soul to remain unaffected by matter will enable the soul to contemplate with the One until it withdraws into its immaterial origins. To Plotinus and his followers, the human body and its material concerns 
therefore became things to overcome in order to achieve unity with the One, which led many Neoplatonic philosophers to adopt sexual chastity and ascetic lifestyles. Plotinus student Porphyry developed the Neoplatonic philosophy further and explored its practical implications. For Porphyry, the notion of the One became equated with the notion of a supreme god, and the distinction between the intellect and the soul started to become blurry. Porphyry even came to use the word God or the Father when referring to the One, and a greater emphasis was laid on salvation and the soul's immaterial flight from the human body than before. The pagan philosopher Iamblichus, who in turn was a student of Porphyry, expanded the Neoplatonic philosophy's religious aspects even farther, placing a great emphasis on religious rites and rituals designed to make it possible to purify the soul and get in contact with the One, which can be seen in Iamblichus and his followers' acceptance of the Chaldean Oracle's revelations as divine expressions. So where do Hypatia fit in this philosophical evolution? She is likely to have received her philosophical training during the 370s, which was a time when Plotinus and Porphyry's ideas were widespread among philosophers across the Mediterranean, while Iambicus' ideas, which would come to be widespread during the early 5th century, was only held by a small group of philosophers. Judging by what we know about Hypatia, she is likely to have been a Neoplatonist in the tradition of Plotinus and Porphyry, but not in the tradition of Iamblichus. She was devoted to a monotheistic god, or at least something very similar, and she placed a great importance on the salvation of her soul, bodily purity and asceticism. A perfect example of this can be seen in the story of how Hypatia rejected a student who fell in love with her. The 5th century philosopher Demasius tells of an incident of his student who were unable to control his feelings and expressed his love for Hypatia in public. In response Hypatia showed him a sanitary napkin with her menstrual blood, telling him, this is what you really love young man, but you do not love beauty for its own sake. The account has a deeply neoplatonic dimension, and it shows two things. First that Hypatia had a very dim view on her own body, and also that she condemned chasing after material things instead of focusing one's mind towards true beauty, which lies in the mind of God or the One. While Hypatia's philosophy placed a central importance on spiritual salvation, it was at the same time non-confessional, in that it was not tied to any organized religion. To Hypatia, salvation was mainly to be received through philosophical contemplation, bodily purity, and mastering of moral virtues, and were therefore devoid of any pagan rituals, which made it well suited for the needs of her students, since it could easily come to be adopted by both pagans and Christians alike. Hypatia's Neoplatonic philosophy was, as stated earlier, in certain ways tied to Hypatia's interest in mathematics and astronomy, which goes all the way back to the philosopher Plato. Plato, similar to Hypatia, thought that the soul's flight from the body and transcendence into a higher spiritual reality, which he called the world of forms, was man's highest purpose. Since subjects like mathematics and astronomy dealt with things that had geometrical properties, Plato argued that studying those subjects could remind the soul of the world of forms, and therefore help in guiding the soul beyond the material world and into the world of forms. This was most likely also how Hypatia viewed those subjects, and she encouraged her students to view philosophy as the divine mystery, and to view mathematics and astronomy as tools to help them go beyond the material world and into the area where there is only mystical experience. She was revered by her students, Christians and non-Christians alike, and the primary sources indicates that she was both seen as a philosophical and spiritual teacher, and by some students even as divine. Hypatia unfortunately lived in a time where Alexandria experienced much political turmoil, and despite her perceived wisdom and the high regard she was held by both the elites and common citizens of Alexandria, it could not save her from the political violence that took place in Alexandria during the early 5th century. The death of Hypatia is a tragic topic, and to fully understand its circumstances, we need to look at the historical context of Alexandria in the late 4th and early 5th century. 
By the late 4th century, Alexandria had become a majority Christian city, and since his pontificate in year 385, the Alexandrian bishop Theophilus had campaigned against the remaining pagan sects in the city. The most well-known example of this campaign was the destruction of the Serapium temple in around 391. Whatever Hypatia might have thought about this, the conflict between the pagans and Christians in Alexandria had no effect on her life or philosophical activity. Bishop Theophilus did not care about her, since her Neoplatonism was non-doctrinal, and since she was not a conventional pagan, she had no need to conceal the fact that she was a non-Christian. There is no evidence of either her or any of her students being present at the site of any battles between pagans and Christians, and none of Hypatia's Christian students got in trouble for being part of her philosophical circle. However, in year 412, Bishop Theophilus died and was replaced by his nephew Cyril. Cyril was held in pretty low regard by his contemporaries, and the primary sources describes him as ruthless and power-hungry. His succession as bishop therefore caused unrest among ecclesiastical circles in Alexandria, and two factions emerged among the clergy. One that supported Cyril as bishop of Alexandria, and another that supported Theophilus' archdeacon called Timothy. The conflict soon got violent, and street fighting broke out that lasted for three days, with Cyril being victorious and installed as bishop soon after. After his installment, Cyril went on to secure his power base by neutralizing groups that had opposed him during his conflict with Timothy, and groups that could be potential obstacles to his temporal power. In around 414, he targeted the Jewish population in Alexandria by taking advantage of events other groups had initiated, which oddly enough had to do with public dancing. During Saturdays while celebrating the Sabbath, the local Jews of Alexandria enjoyed themselves by attending public dance performances that attracted many people from all groups of society. One Saturday, a known lieutenant of Cyril called Hyrax was present at one of the performances, and the Jews who attended got suspicious and shouted that he was sent by Cyril to cause unrest. The Alexandrian prefect at the time named Orestes also suspected that Hyrax had shown up with bad intentions. Orestes already had hostile views towards Cyril due to the bishop's appropriation of several privileges that formerly belonged to the emperor's officials, and he arrested Hyrax and tortured him publicly, causing wounds so grave that Hyrax died. In response to the death of his lieutenant, Cyril summoned the leaders of the Jewish community and threatened them with severe consequences if they did not stop antagonizing Christians. This in turn angered the Jews, who responded by starting to set up ambushes for the Christians in the city, which came to a point at one night when word spread that the Church of Alexandria was on fire. Many Christian citizens left their homes and ran to the church, in attempts to save it from the flames, but when they arrived, they were attacked by the Jews, resulting in the death of many Christians. Cyril quickly took advantage of the event, and responded with gathering a large mob of Christians, and counterattacked the Jewish community in Alexandria, forcing many of the Jewish citizens to leave the city. The violence that was taking place was seen negatively by several members in Alexandria's ecclesiastical community, and some of the clergy compelled Cyril to reconcile with Orestes and end the violence. Cyril accepted this, and he is reported to have arranged a meeting with Orestes, where he shall have presented the Bible to the prefect, believing that their shared religion could make them put aside their differences and make peace with each other. Orestes, however, refused to cooperate with the bishop, leading many people associated with Cyril to contemplate other methods to apply pressure to the prefect. Orestes' opposition against the bishop was shared by influential people in the city's ruling class, and by Hypatia. Their opposition against Cyril likely stemmed from Cyril's violent actions against his political opponents, and his extension of power into areas governed by the civil authorities, which was unlike his predecessor Theophilus, who had cooperated with the civil authorities rather than working against them. Hypatia was, as mentioned earlier, a powerful individual, being held in high regard by the city's ruling elite, and having contacts in high places all throughout the empire, and since she moved freely in the city, she was both a powerful and easy target for Cyril's followers. 
Among people associated with Cyril, rumors started to grow that Hypatia was the one responsible for the prefect's refusal to reconcile with the bishop. Neoplatonists of the tradition of Iamblichus were known for practicing magic and theurgical rites, and while Hypatia was not of the Amblican tradition, this was a distinction that few people outside the civil and ecclesiastical elites understood. As a result, word started to spread among Cyril's followers that Hypatia was enchanting Orestes and needed to be stopped in order for the prefect and the bishop to reconcile. In 1415, a mob of people gathered and took to the streets to confront her. This mob is usually thought to have been sent out by Cyril with the intention to kill Hypatia, but in the political context of the later Roman Empire, it's quite unlikely. The scholar Edward G. Watts points out that the later Roman world was a violent place, where urban mobs often took to the streets to confront members of the Roman elite. But these mobs rarely set out with murder in mind, but almost always with the intention to scare the public official into withdrawing from public life. Watts argues that this is likely to have been the intention of the mob that sent out to encounter Hypatia, but that things quickly got out of control during the encounter, which resulted in Hypatia's brutal death by the mob in the streets of Alexandria. Unfortunately, her death, as we will soon see, has historically been the main reason to why Hypatia would come to be remembered. The death of Hypatia has ever since the 18th century often been seen as the end of ancient philosophy and science, and the beginning of a Christian dark age. Unfortunately, this picture is still being reproduced by several history popularizers. For those who are not familiar, here's a short recap. And you see how people like Cyril could change a world. He is a man seeking power. And he wishes to gain control not just of the religious state, he wants to really run a theocracy, be in charge of everything. Hypatia is a wealthy, educated pagan. To him, that means witch. Cyril, the bishop of Alexandria, despised her. In part because of her close friendship with the Roman governor, but also because she was symbolized. She was a symbol of learning and science, which were largely identified by the early church with Paganism. If science ever had a martyr, it was Hypatia. At the risk of her own life, she refused to be swayed by these mindless fanatics and carried on doing what she loved, and that was teaching, in pursuing science, mathematics, and philosophy as the world around her tore itself apart. She remained true to her beliefs, right up until the very end. These presentations hardly captures the circumstances of Hypatia's death, nor what came to follow after it. The scholar Maria de Sielskai points out that Hypatia's murder had nothing to do with either her philosophy, her being a non-Christian, or even her being a woman for that matter. None of the primary sources mention Cyril's followers attacking her on the basis of her gender, and her murder don't have any connections with any anti-pagan policy in Alexandria, since Cyril did not start to persecute pagans until more than 10 years after Hypatia's death. As for the claim that Hypatia's death marked the end of ancient science and philosophy, this also is not true. As I've shown in one of my earlier videos, the early Christians were not hostile to ancient science and philosophy, but viewed them as handmaidens of theology, being accepted as legitimate methods to gain knowledge about the natural world, but which preferably should be pursued only if doing so had theological value, which was not very far from how their pagan contemporaries view the same subjects. The claim made by Sagan and others that the early church equated ancient philosophy with the pagan religion is peculiarly laughable, which becomes evident in the light of the early Christian view towards Neoplatonism. In the late Roman Empire, nearly all Christian thinkers were Neoplatonists, which was a philosophy that was not only developed by pagans, but by pagans who were vehemently anti-Christian the pagan philosopher Porphyry being the prime example, with his most famous work being a collection of 15 books called Against the Christians. As for Alexandria itself, it continued to be a center for learning in the Eastern Roman Empire for centuries after Hypatia's death, producing thinkers who continued to elaborate on the thoughts of Plato and Aristotle. 
Ironically, the death of Hypatia was actually followed by an intellectual high point in Alexandrian philosophy during the 5th and 6th century, with philosophers like Ammonius, Damasius, Simplicius, and of course the empire's greatest philosopher of late antiquity, John Philoponus. In conclusion was the death of Hypatia, to use the words of the scholar Maria de Sielska, a murder for a political purpose, and it had nothing to do with the supposed fall of reason or end of ancient philosophy. These sorts of pseudo-historical narratives are unwarranted, and they don't appreciate the actual historical Neoplatonic philosopher, who once lived in Alexandria during the 4th and 5th century, called Hypatia. If you're interested in learning more about the life of Hypatia, I can recommend you to pick up the books Hypatia, The Life and Legend of an Ancient Philosopher by Edward G. Watts, and Hypatia of Alexandria by Maria de Sielska. And don't forget that if you like this video and want to see more videos like it, hit the like, share and subscribe buttons.